You are the fairest of the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Alleluia. became glistening intensely white, as no fuller on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking to Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is well that we are here. Let us make three booths, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were exceedingly afraid. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved Son, listen to him. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen, until the Son of Man should have risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace, peace, and much joy to you, people of God. Jesus told Peter, James, and John to tell no one about the transfiguration until the Son of Man should have risen from the dead. That is because the transfiguration is an adumbration, a foretaste of the glory of the risen Lord. We hear the story of the transfiguration here as we stand on the threshold of the season of Lent, the season of preparation for the celebration at Easter of Christ's cross and resurrection. We hear this story because the transfiguration of Jesus is also an adumbration of the glory that all the baptized will share with the risen Lord in God's good time. The Transfiguration comes, Mark tells us, six days later. Six days later than what? I mean, the Epiphany season is longer than six days. The, uh, the, the visit of the Magi and the, the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan and Jesus' first sign, the uh, the multiplication of wine at the marriage of Cana, that all came at the beginning of this season, back, you know, early on in January. This manifestation of Jesus' glory in the Transfiguration is an echo of those things. The voice from heaven at Jesus' baptism identifies him in the same way as the voice from the cloud at the Transfiguration, this is my beloved son. But at the Transfiguration, the voice goes on and says, listen to him. And that's where the six days comes in. Because it was just six days prior to this event, as St. Mark tells the story, that at Caesarea Philippi, Peter confessed that Jesus was the Christ. And then Jesus began to speak. 
he began for the first time to teach about his suffering and his death and his rising again. And he went on to amplify and flesh out the call to follow that he had extended to these disciples at the beginning of their ministry with him. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For those who would save their lives will lose them, and those who lose their lives for my sake and the Gospels will save them. When the voice from heaven says, listen to him, that's what he's been saying. That call and this vision stand right at the midpoint of St. Mark's Gospel. It's the only time in Mark's story that Jesus goes up a high mountain. And there he encounters two Old Testament figures who had encounters with God on a mountain. Moses, who was for 40 days on Mount Sinai before he received the Ten Commandments. And Elijah, who went on a 40-day journey to Mount Carmel, where he heard the still, small voice of God. These two are with Jesus and his inner circle of disciples on the mountain. Today, the lectionary invites us to think a little bit about one of those characters, Elijah, the 9th century prophet, 9th century BC. We hear the story of what's classically called the translation of Elijah. His being taken away from his uh, protege, Elisha, who becomes his successor. But the way the story is told is fraught with mystery. I mean, for one thing, the journey that Elijah and Elisha go on is, seems pointless. Gilgal is just a stone's throw from the Jordan. Jericho is a few miles further away. Bethel is a great big detour. At each of these places, there is a shrine back in these days of Israel's history, and each of the shrine has its complement of the company of the prophets. These are the ones who these are the ones who are concerned to maintain the faith in the Lord as against the incursions of the fertility cult of the god Baal into the into Israelite society. They maintain these shrines, and they try to maintain the faith. And at each of the stops on this circuitous, seemingly pointless journey, Elisha has a conversation with the company of the prophets about what's going to happen. Finally, they come to the Jordan, and Elisha's mantle takes a role here. If we remember back into 1 Kings, the story of when Elijah first called Elisha to become his protege and eventual successor, he throws his mantle over Elisha as he's plowing in the fields. And that indicates that he's calling. Now he rolls up his mantle, strikes the Jordan River, and they go through dry shod. Does that sound familiar? It ought to. It sounds like Moses and the people of Israel going through the sea on the way out of slavery in Egypt in the Exodus. And it also sounds like Joshua and the people going through the Jordan dry shod as they enter into the promised land after their 40 years of wanderings. And on the other side, on the other side, 
of the Jordan. Elisha receives what he had asked for. The double portion of Elijah's spirit doesn't mean that he wants to be twice the prophet Elijah is. The double portion is the portion of the firstborn. Elijah is Elisha's spiritual father. And Elijah is saying, let me then inherit from you as your spiritual son. And he is vouchsafed in the strangest and most mysterious part of his strange and mysterious story. Elisha is vouchsafed the vision of the unseen army of the Lord of hosts. My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horses. God's invisible army shows up from time to time in the Old Testament. This is one of the most vivid times. We speak of the Lord of hosts. The translation of that, really, more directly, would be the Lord of armies. This host is God's army. And that Elisha receives this vision of the invisible host indicates that his prophetic word will also be God's weapon in the fight against idolatry, the fight against sin, the fight that goes on from the 9th century BC right on up through our own time. We stand on the threshold of Lent, which to many people seems like a circuitous and pointless journey for a diet for 40 days plus Sundays, bringing us to Easter. But the journey is intended to be as fraught with mystery as are the stories of the transfiguration of Jesus and the translation of Elijah. We stand on the threshold of a time which is not designed as a straightforward attempt to pull ourselves up by our own spiritual bootstraps so that we'll be better people by Easter. I mean, you know, doing something important like giving up chocolate. <laughs> the season of Lent is designed to be a kind of a mysterious experience for us. We might be called to engage in Lenten disciplines that we don't really completely understand, but that we're told will bring us closer to God. We will surely be told that over the course of this 40 days, which will begin with the beginning of the Lenten fast on Wednesday of this week, we will engage in practices that will bring us closer to God, that will enable us to hear God's word. The voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Over the course of Lent, we will try to listen. And the epistle for this day says that the gospel that we hear may be veiled we may or may not see the adumbration, the foretaste of what awaits Jesus on the other side of the cross and the empty tomb, and what awaits us when we finally come to that place that the, the story of the translation of, of Elijah and the transfiguration of our Lord are trying to bring us, the place where the season of Lent is trying to bring us, to an understanding of that reality behind and above our ordinary lives. At each step of the journey that Elijah and Elisha take, Elijah indicates his willingness to be separated from this ordinary world. And Lent is our willingness to be separated from this ordinary world so that we might now spiritually 
and finally in God's time actually come to that unseen heaven above and behind our ordinary lives where there is no death and where we like Peter, James, and John, will finally, at the end of our 40-day journey, we'll see no one with us but Jesus only. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.